Morning, St. John's. We're going to raise a hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King Good morning, St. John's, and welcome to worship virtually for our 9 o'clock contemporary service. It's great to see you this morning, and we want to ask you to register your attendance in the link in the comments section of the live stream, please. Please also remember that the available seats for the 11 o'clock in-person worship service become available on our website at 3 o'clock the Sunday before each service. Today at 3, next week's service will be open for seating. That is November 15th. Now, if you are placed on the waiting list, we ask you to please go on and sign up. It is very helpful to gauge how many people are ready to come back to worship. 
and will help us make decisions about opening additional seating and or adding additional services. In-person worship for this service, the 9 o'clock contemporary service, is scheduled to begin in the St. John Center on the last Sunday of the month, November 29th, which is the first Sunday in Advent. And if you would like to volunteer to help with registration and check in at either service, please contact uh, our Director of Music and Worship, Dr. Timothy Bell Flowers. And if you help, you have a seat. So that is a nice opportunity for you. Um, like the traditional services, reservations will be required and seating will be somewhat limited to encourage social distancing. Uh, keep looking to our social media outlets for more information in the coming days. A few other announcements. The Barber Hardin Sunday School class is in the midst of their annual pecan sale. You may stop by the church office during the week to purchase your pecans. They are also available after the in-person 11 o'clock services. We're in process of setting up cottage meetings with myself. And the purpose of the cottage meetings is to provide socially distant opportunities for the congregation to get to know me better and vice versa for me to learn about your preferences, dreams, ideas, uh, concerns about St. John's. Uh, and we're going to have some in-person meetings at the church later next month and probably a Zoom offering as well. So watch your email for further communication about cottage meetings taking place in a neighborhood near you. And if you can't come to the one to which you are assigned, look for the dates of the others and come to one of them. It's more important that we get to meet each other and hear your ideas than necessarily you going in your neighborhood. We would like for you to, but if you can't, we understand. And one last announcement, Troop 925, our Boy Scout troop, has begun its annual barbecue sale. Please see the opportunities email that goes out on Fridays for more information. Let me mention some prayer concerns for our church family uh, this morning. We want to continue to remember Meredith and Sam Epps, who are getting ready to have their first baby late in November. Uh, Kathy Hyatt's daughter, Lori, is having some tests next week. We want to remember both Sylvia Knox and David Legrand following the death of their spouses recently. Leela J. Long is having some chemo, and she's in the hospital, or has been in the hospital in Charlotte uh, this past week. Let us also remember Bev Moon, Jimmy Mullinax, Jonathan Pitt, and Betty Rawls, all who are dealing with uh, medical issues and treatments and tests right now. I invite you to go with me to God for prayer. Each morning we arise, O Lord, wondering what the day will bring. For some of us, there are many wonderful things to anticipate new opportunities to celebrate. We smile at the sun and revel in its warmth. Even in the midst of trouble, your love comes through to us in the most amazing ways. For our friends and families who experience great joy at this time, we offer our prayers of joy. May the warmth of your restoring and transforming love, O oh God, flow over them and through them to others. For many people, pain and hurt seem to be the daily encounter with life. Hope for something better is a distant vision. Be with our brothers and sisters in their pain. Lord, we ask for your healing love to surround them as they journey through life. Give them courage and peace with our words and in our hearts. We are with them who struggle and suffer. For all your healing mercies, we gratefully thank you. And we offer such prayers that their lives, the lives of others, may be filled with your love and peace. Help us walk faithfully in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ in this new week. Amen.
Some people think you're distant Just some words on a page They are nothing more than fables Handed down along the way But I've seen you part the waters Where no one else could pull me from the deep It's who you are to me made of stone but I know you live inside my heart I know that it's your home and I've seen you in a sunset in the eyes of a stranger on the street it's who you are to me you're amazing faithful love's open door when I'm in invite you to stand as you're able in body or in spirit as we say together the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This is the time of the year when we are asked to think about stewardship, how we use the talents and abilities and gifts and prayers that God has provided to us for his purposes and for his church. And I want to be honest with you. We have a revenue issue at St. John's. On no Sunday, in September, October, or thus far one in November before today, have we met our weekly operating budget need, which is $27,432. You might as well say 28,000. The smallest deficit was on October 11th at the amount of almost $3,500. The highest was the week before at $15,450. And if you average out over those nine weeks beginning September 6th, we were a few dollars shy of receiving $9,000 per week. Divide nine into 27. It doesn't look too good. And this is really not a sustainable situation. We cannot continue like this without some sort of change. The staff is sought to be very frugal in their spending. We've had vacant staff positions. Simply put, our giving must grow and grow strongly or we're going to be facing significant large budget cuts. And I don't think this is really a new thing around St. John's. I think we've struggled with this for a good while. It is a critical situation made worse by the lack of many uh, in-person worship services during these COVID-19 months. But even last week when we resumed in-person 11 a.m. services at capacity, our giving was a bit over $13,000 short. Now let's go back and think. Why do we give? Some persons give out of obligation. They feel guilty if they do not give. They have been taught that way, and that is the way they live. They are committed to give because it is the way it has always been. For some individuals, guilt has been replaced by meaning. And so they say, if it's meaningful to them, they will give to it. Some people give as a tax write-off. However, due to recent tax law changes, there's not really as much incentive to give as there was in the past. And besides, we must also help individuals grow beyond the idea of giving for personal Gain. I prefer for us to see giving not as an obligation, not as a duty, not as something that is constraining and chaining and, and dark and gloomy or simply to keep the tax folks happy. I prefer us to see giving as a joyous response to God. All we have comes from God. And then we will respond to the many gifts God has provided us. We should have an attitude of joy and hope. We are delighted with what God has given, and we respond with joy to his gifts of love, hope, encouragement, family, health, and most of all, his amazing grace. Finally, giving must not be a practical decision alone. Yes, as I have told you, the church has obligations. We have uh, buildings and people and programs to take care of. 
But giving must be a spiritual, not just a practical decision. It's a spiritual decision that helps us put God first in our lives. And when God is in control of that part of your life, then the other parts of your life are easier to live. Eventually, God will be in charge of all your life. An abundant life and living does not mean a life with the most material possessions. It is not who gets the most toys. Abundant life is a life lived to the fullest. A life lived with God. I want to tell you about a church member that I had in my first, one of my first churches. Her name was Eve McClellan. When I knew her, she was a uh, older woman in her late 80s, beautiful white hair that she wore in this bun tied in the back. Her husband had died fairly early. There was an indication that the marriage was okay, but not really the happiest. She had no children. I remember distinctively her still cutting her grass in her huge yard there in her late 80s. A new parsonage was built in the early 1960s. Eve McClellan baked and sold rolls on top of rolls on top of rolls for the purpose of helping to pay for the parsonage. In fact, the expression was in the church that the new parsonage was built on the foundation of Eve McClellan's roles. She was a favorite of my wife's Donna. They would sit together and she had a joyous, wonderful laugh. When Eve died a few weeks before we left to start a new congregation at Pauley's Island in Litchfield Beach, she told me, and her sister told me that her estate was left in its far largest part to the McClellanville United Methodist Church. You see, her frugality, because she lived a very simple life, and her stewardship of the resources God gave her will bring eternal blessings and help to that very small congregation, which is much smaller than some of our Sunday school classes here at St. John's. In the next two weeks, Reverend Powell and I will be preaching and laypersons will be speaking about the why and how of giving. You need to be present in person or virtually. You need to be attentive. The time is now, and as I have said, we need to dig deep. Think again, why do you give, and how do you give? I pray you will learn to give as a joyous response of thanks to God and from a spiritual decision. I cannot impress enough upon you that your response is essential, vital, critical to St. John's for the remainder of 2020, this wonderful year we've had, but we've had it, and next year as well. I thank you for listening to these words. I hope you will pray and reflect upon them and hopefully their call and tug on your heart and life. Now is the time when we come for our offering to give as God has provided to us by way of ourselves and our resources. And you can see in the worship bulletin information and on the screen, I believe, about how to give electronically. Checks are still welcome 
cash as well. You may drop them at the church office or you may mail them to the church. As I have told you and explained, it is a critical time in our church's life. And I pray for us to be open in our hearts to hear God's promise of life eternal to open up our lives as Christ has sacrificially given himself to us, that we might bring gifts of mercy, peace, and sacrifice. Amen. Um, good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Ryan. Uh, 
Ryan Powell, I'm the associate pastor here at St. John's, and I'm excited to, to bring our message this morning. Uh, thank you, band. I don't want to turn around too much. Thank you, band, uh, for that beautiful music. Uh, that song, uh, it, it really resonates with the, the theme of today, uh, the hope of today in our message. Uh, pastor David, thank you for that word on stewardship. Uh, as I was listening to you talk, uh, all I could think about was Jerry Maguire. Um, and the part where Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooding Jr. are yelling, show me the money, um, but I'm here and dig deep, um, which is, is something we need to do. And, and I, I think we need to realize as we go into this stewardship campaign, we're in the stewardship season, and hopefully you've been seeing the videos um, that we've been putting out weekly uh, that, that show they're a testament to what your giving goes to and what's at stake. Um, and really that's the kingdom of God. You know, our mission as a, a greater church, a, a worldwide church, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Uh, and that's what your giving goes to support, um, helps fund. And today what we're going to do is, is we're going to dig in to the why. The why of what we give. We're going to take what Pastor Davis gave us a, a few minutes ago. We're going to expound on that. We're going to dig in a little bit deeper. So if you have your Bibles and you care to follow along, uh, we're going to st uh, start looking in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to read verses 1 through 15. So join with me as we read God's Word. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this was not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. Remember that. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started... So he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove, but to prove by the earnestness, earnestness of others that you love also, that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty we might become rich. And in this matter, I give my judgments. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness is desiring it may be, uh, may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what a person or what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered a little had no lack. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So what I want to do uh, starting out this morning is I want to give us a little bit of context, a little, little understanding of what's going on here, because if this is one of those passages, if you just kind of jump into it and, and don't fully understand what's happening, you, you kind of get lost, uh, lost in the narrative, lost in the story. And so what we have here, Paul is, is in a place called Macedonia. Uh, he's writing uh, his, uh, well, this, if you look at it historically, this might not necessarily be his second letter. We know it as his second letter. Uh, but this could have been a third or fourth letter that he rent, wrote to the people at Corinth, the Corinthians there. And he's writing this letter, and, and, and he's got, uh, in this moment, in chapter 8, and it really spills over into chapter 9, he, he's making a plea. Uh, he's raising money uh, for what is the mother church, uh, because he's there in uh, Macedonia, and he's been in Corinth, and 
Paul was a church planner. He started new churches. He was reaching new people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was bringing, well, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he was bringing Jews and Gentiles together. And he was there campaigning, so to speak. He was running his own stewardship campaign for the Jerusalem church, which in some scholarly works, this would be called the Jerusalem Collection. Because what had happened back in Jerusalem due to some famines and other circumstances, there was uh, some significant economic hardship going on in Jerusalem, and they were really suffering. And so Paul is going out there, raising money at these other churches. Uh, Mind you, these are new churches. These are new Christians uh, who are suffering their own economic struggles as well. Uh, In particular, in this area, Macedonia, And to kind of open your eyes a little bit more to to what Macedonia was, think Philippi, think Thessalonica, uh, or you might know it as the book of Philippians, the letter to the Philippians, or the letter to the Thessalonians. They had gone through their own hardships. See, they had just suffered a civil war uh, that left a lot of wreckage, left a lot of economic hardships. So there was some extreme poverty uh, in this place as well. Um, But yet... uh, they served as an incredible example, an incredible example of what it means to faithfully give. Uh, and they give us a good picture of the why. Uh, at my first church appointment, uh, we'll, we'll both share stories of our first church appointment. A couple of years ago uh, in uh, Chesterfield, South Carolina, I was serving at Zora United Methodist Church. We were a country church way out in the middle of nowhere, really. And uh, we experienced the hit of Hurricane Florence, if you remember uh, that coming through. Hurricane Florence was a massive hurricane. It was a very slow-moving hurricane. Uh, And it dumped roughly 26 inches of rain over two or three days right there in the town of Chesterfield in that Sherrall area. Um, and, and it just created so much flooding in our area. The, the basement of our church, it flooded out. And one of the neat things, if you can believe there's neat things that come out of that, uh, was to see, and one of the incredible things was to see other churches from our connection in the South Carolina Annual Conference rally around, send us gift cards, send us money to help us kind of fight through that time, to get through that hardship we experienced. It, it really lived into, if we go back to Pastor David's first sermon, when he preached out of Acts 2, uh, that love for one another, that bearing one another's burdens, that shared life together. Uh, and I think that's what we see here in, in this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We, we see that lived out. We see the body of Christ living out together. And we see these new believers doing this incredible work, doing this incredible thing, dig, digging deep out of their own poverty Uh, to give extravagantly. It it really reminds me, and I wasn't prepared for this, but uh, it reminds me if if you flip back to Luke um, chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, this just came to my mind. Uh, Look at verses 1 through 4. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, the poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. And she put in all she had to live on. See, that was, that, that, that's faith. Uh, that's believing in something bigger than we are ourselves. That was what drove her. That was her why. And I've entitled this message, even though I'm well into it, I've entitled this message, The Why in Stewardship. Now, I'm not crazy. Um, well, yeah, I am. But I know how to spell, sort of. Uh, and I, I'm telling you, there's whys in stewardship. And I'm going to look at three whys today of, of what stewardship really means. Uh, and kind of, like I said, expound on what Pastor David brought us to. Uh, there was a word that he mentioned earlier. He said duty. Um, and, and how we don't necessarily want to look at stewardship. And stewardship, 
mind you, we can look at it as finances, but really stewardship is, is a management. It is a way of looking at all aspects of our life, whether it's our finances, whether it's our gifts, our talents, our resources that God has given us. It's being good stewards of that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But our stewardship, and in particular today, when it comes to our finances, it, we can claim it as a duty. We can go back through Scripture, and we can see commands, uh, calls for us to give our tithe. We, we saw that in the Old Testament uh, when they had to give a tenth of their crops and different aspects like that. We can understand that it is a duty. But I want to present to you today that there is, and this is the first why, there is privilege in that duty. There is privilege in that duty. And what do I mean by that? In our giving, in our stewardship, we're being invited to be a part of God's story. If you remember, I keep going back to old sermons, whether it be myself or David, but if you remember a couple of weeks ago when I got the opportunity to preach, I spoke on, on I talked about the narrative, uh, the narrative of Scripture, the grand story of Scripture. And, and in, in our giving, um, in our stewardship of our, our, whether it's our money, our talents, whatever, God is inviting us. He's inviting us to be a part of that story. He's inviting us to be a part of the narrative. If you want to um, look at Philippians, this kind of gives us a picture, and this was one of the groups that Paul was, was referring to, but we kind of get an idea of what that looks like. Um, that's Colossians. Starting in verse 10, forward, uh, verse 10, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have reviewed your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking on being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. I, in every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who has strengthened me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered to partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs. And once again, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Ephroditus the gifts that you have sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches, his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father may be the glory forever and ever. And amen. See, that doesn't sound like duty to me. That sounds like privilege. That sounds like golden opportunity that God is laying right there before us. And speaking of opportunity, our second why in stewardship is there is opportunity out of necessity. There is opportunity out of necessity. Stewardship is always necessary in the Christian life. In a lot of ways, stewardship really boils down to self-control. Stewardship is self-control. It is management of our money. It is management of our resources. If you go back to Galatians chapter 5, what is one of the fruits of the Spirit? It is self-control. It is being good stewards of what God has given us. And the truth and the reality for us today is that out of necessity, opportunity is birthed. Now, Pastor David, a minute ago, kind of put a joke on 2020. And let's be honest, 2020 has not been fun. Whether it's COVID, whether it's a seemingly endless election cycle, whether it's hurricanes, whether it's killer hornets, whether it's the fact that the LA Dodgers and the LA Lakers both won championships this year, this year has not been fun. There have been a lot of struggles that we've had to face. And we've heard and we know that one institution, one body that has felt the weight of 2020 is the church. The church has taken a huge hit this year. Just, I mean, you heard the reality of our situation. 
And we, we spent time this week reviewing the numbers, looking over our weekly giving over the last several weeks. And that makes it, looking at that kind of a situation, it makes it really difficult and hard to budget for an upcoming year. And you begin to wonder what opportunities will be missed. It is so important that you take this seriously, that we really do some self-examination, and we do dig deep. But out of this year, there has been incredible opportunity. There has been people, because the church isn't the only folks in that boat. There are folks out there who are hurting. There are folks out there who have nothing. And we have such an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. See, the church isn't is in a building. It's not where we are today. Um, it is a group of believers living shared life together with a common identity in Christ. That's what the church is. And we have such a beautiful opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ to those we come into contact with. But part of that is going to be, it is going to require our stewardship. And in particular, it's going to be our stewardship of our finances. Maybe that'll work. Sorry about that. And that segues me into my final why of why do we push stewardship? Why is stewardship so important? And it is spiritual elevation out of material giving. Spiritual elevation out of material giving. What do I mean by that? Whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's talents, there is a spiritual elevation that comes when we do that. However, and I, I want to stress this very clearly, this does not buy your stewardship, does not buy you a spot in heaven. It does not set you right with God. It does not mean that if you do this, something magical, something wonderful happens. That's not what I'm saying here. The only way humanity, people, all of us are set right with God is through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Let's be clear about that and his resurrection. So our giving, our stewardship, isn't an effort to get something out of God. Rather, it is a response to something and something that he has already done through us. And through that, we are spiritually elevated, not by our own efforts, but by the work of Jesus in in and through the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so what I want to do is I want to revisit one of the verses in 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 8. And it kind of sets up the stage for us to close out of here. So in chapter 8, verse 8, Paul says this. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, my sake, and all of our sake, he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. We're going to get rich because of what Jesus did for us? Hold on. And in this matter, I give my judgment that this benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also a desire to do it. Paul isn't dictating command here, and neither am I. What Paul is doing and what I hope to be doing today is point all of us to Jesus and to see what he did for us. What did he do? Look back at verse 9. He says, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. One of my favorite books of the Bible, I believe, really paints this picture. And there are so many gems peppered all the way through it. And that book is Ephesians. And so what I want to do to kind of really capture how we are spiritually elevated through our giving, through our response how God uses that to spiritually elevate us. The, the why 
and why we give can be seen all through Ephesians. So bear with me just a moment and just let these words just kind of wash over you. Starting in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Move on to chapter 2. But God being rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. And finally, in verse, oh, chapter 3, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When you read and listen to those words and they just wash over you, My prayer is that you fully understand how loved by the Father you are. That you feel, feel those arms just wrap around you. And as Pastor David said earlier, that you see the grace that just pours and washes over us. A lot of you are going to roll your eyes at me for this last bit, and I'm okay with that. Um, I might even frustrate some of you, and that's fine. Um, But for me, uh, last week, November 1st, I know we celebrated All Saints Day, and it was was a great opportunity, and I I love the the chance to remember the saints that go on before us. But for me, uh, that's another day. That's the start of my Christmas season. Uh, I am that guy uh, who kicks off Christmas. Uh, really, I would put up my Christmas tree the night before, but we do the trick-or-treating thing. Uh, but I love Christmas. I love the Advent season, um, everything about it, the music, the decorations. Uh, I, I love the message behind Advent of expectation and, and the hope that we have in Jesus and Him coming down um, incarnate and uh, all of it. I, I love it. And one of the things I love is, is the giving of gifts. It's nice to receive gifts, but I love to give gifts. And since becoming a dad, I, I love to give gifts to my father, or my, uh, my children, um, just to see them light up. And uh, just the, the love that they, they have, uh, it's just, it's cool. It, it's fun to watch that happen. Um, and, and so over the years, uh, they have... In response to that, they, they get to go to the dollar store and go buy gifts for us and uh, other family members. And just to see the joy they have in that. Um, and there's so much love in that. And if I really had to boil all of this down to what is the why in our stewardship, It would be that. It would be the love. It would be the grace that the Father pours down on us. And we don't do stewardship. We don't do tithing. We don't do anything to receive that love. As as Paul in Ephesians has already told us, that love was there before the fabric of time was knitted together. And our giving and our stewardship, when we let that grace wash over us, There comes a point where it's just a response to say, God, I want to be a part of what you've got going on in this world. I want to be a part of that story because of how much you have blown me away with your immeasurable mercy and riches and grace. The 
truth is we serve a God who is madly in love with us. And it really is unfathomable how much he loves us. And regardless of what we've done or what we haven't done, he pours it out on us every day. And we get to be a part of that for other people. We're invited into this story. His love is extravagant. It is the extravagant love of the Father that was shown through His Son, Jesus, that was ignited and is ignited by the Holy Spirit in our lives. That is where and why our stewardship should come from. So, in closing, my question to you is what is the why in stewardship for you? Will you pray with me? God, I, I, I pray that we're awakened to the extravagance of your love today. And, and we're awakened to the opportunity that we have before us. And that's to be a part of your story. To be a part of, of your mission. To be a part of reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be a part of putting food in the mouths of those who can't themselves, to be able to put a roof over the head of those that can't, to, to create a space where we can come together as a body of Christ, to glorify you, to worship you, to exalt you. God, awaken in our hearts the reality of how much you love us. And through that, spur us into action. And God, we pray specifically today for the action of stewardship. As we dig deep in our own souls and we do some real self-examination, and God, that we would be honest with ourselves and that we would be honest with you and that we would be bold to take courageous steps as we move into 2021. God, I believe you've got big plans for this community. And my hope is, is that we can be a part of that. And it starts right here. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Christ's name. Amen.
Amen, amen. Uh, in closing, I, I thought it would be fitting to end the, the final greeting that, that Paul offered uh, those at the church at Corinth at the end of 2 Corinthians. So finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for the restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. See you next week.